in the Gospel of John still, church. So if you take out your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 15. We're going to close out chapter 15 and do just a few verses in chapter 16 this morning in order to complete the context. Today's reading will begin with verse 18. John chapter 15. A message entitled, Hated by the World. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Oh God, we thank you for the reading of your word today. We pray now as we work through it, that you be our teacher. Lord, help me as the one preaching. To be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is a hard text, right? Anytime in the 21st century you read a passage from Scripture and you're hearing words like hate, you're reading a tough text. For the modern reader, this is tough going. But this is the reality. Friendship with Christ is enmity with the world. And because that's the condition, that's the reality in which we live, we need encouragement. In fact, I would put it this way, because we are so often discouraged in the face of the world's opposition. I mean, that's just a reality. I mean, there's a few of you in the room who live without being discouraged by opposition, but for most human beings, rejection is tough to live with. So because we are often discouraged in the face of the world's opposition, Jesus gives us a remedy. He says we must remember, we must remember his words and deeds in order to be strengthened in the hope and reality that we do not live for today or for the applause of men, but rather we live for the future and for the applause of God. That's the message in a nutshell. If you, could, if you could embrace that reality, that hope, that truth, and live out of it, you will find yourself being encouraged greatly. So as I unfold this this morning, I got three headings, uh, a problem or the problem, a solution, and a result. That's the way I'm going to work through it, the problem, the solution, and the result. I think, it, I think the text unfolded pretty well that way. And so I want to look at what the problem is its reality and its source. So look back with me at verses 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it hated, that it has hated me before it hated you. 
That's the reality. Friendship with Christ is enmity with the world. And if you have friendship with the world and enmity with Christ, or you're trying to walk that that fine line between those two things with, with one foot in the church and one foot in the world, you're really a, kind of a half-hearted Christian. And as I said last Sunday, the half-hearted Christian really gets the worst of both worlds. Like a man trying to ride two escalators simultaneously with one foot on each. You are torn in two. Now, I know you'd be hard-pressed to find a place where they got two escalators going up simultaneously where you could put a foot on each one. You know, most of the time in the malls and whatnot, they, uh, they're going opposite directions, facing against one another, you know, opposing one another, as it should be. One going down and one going up. There's a metaphor in that for sure. And the truth is you're either on one or the other. But so many times we're trying to ride both at the same time. And Jesus is really saying there's no room for that in the kingdom of God. And you know it's true in your heart because when you've you've done that, you've really gotten the worst of both worlds. You, you, you you, You don't really get to enjoy sin the way the worldlings do. I mean, there's just no fun in it because you do it and immediately your conscience pricks your heart. You know you've messed up and... Things aren't right. But neither do you really get to enjoy the church. You come, you come to worship and you hear the word of God and your conscience convicts you again. And you're just miserable. You're miserable in both places. And that's the reality. Friendship with Christ is enmity with the world. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. And you would get all the benefits of it. But because you're not of the world, and there's a little translation issue with these, uh, the conjunctions here, but I think think the phrase, even though, might fit better. But because you are not of the world, even though I chose you out of the world, right? He's offering a contrast there. There was a time when you were in the world, and I plucked you out of it. Therefore, the world hates you. You follow that? So remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And anyone else out of that world, if they keep your word, they had, if they kept my word, they're going to also keep yours. That's the way you're going to know whose team you're on, and you're going to know who's on your team as well. This reality of opposition, that is the problem. We live in a world that does not like God or godliness. And we're too often trying to make friends with the world. You know, at the end of the day, that's what's wrong with the church growth movement from the 1960s. When evangelical churches got on that train to build big, large churches, they used, they used some solid biblical rhetoric, you know. The Great Commission. We want to follow the Great Commission. We want to be faithful witnesses and and collect disciples out of the world and grow the church. There's something very important in that. But then we began to hear things like, you know, well, we don't want to change the message, but we need to repackage it so it's more palatable. We began to hear that worship is evangelism and such other notions. And really what we were doing was trying to make a pact. And I say we genuinely because all churches that that in that time period, I think we're affected by this. And if you weren't growing, something was wrong with you. But we forgot that there's different kinds of growth and we, we, we didn't make proper distinctions. And what we ended up doing was trying to make friends with the world. Our worship services became more like rock concerts. Our preaching became more like feel-good talks. And the reality is we got the worst of both worlds. Now, having said that, I don't want you to go away thinking that coming to church is supposed to be dour and sour. Because following Jesus, as Jesus has already shown us, is a relationship that is full of joy and goodness. But the problem is, 
What kind of appetite have we cultivated? I've often said, if you don't enjoy what's happening in church, what makes you think you're going to enjoy what's going on in heaven? And every one of you wants to go to heaven. Most people outside of these four walls want to go to heaven. Most people in our culture even think they're going to heaven. But they have no appetite for the things of God. That's the enmity. Friendship with Christ is enmity with the world. That's the problem. In fact, Jesus' words and deeds both condemn and enrage the world. This is more of the problem. Look at verses 21 through 25. Uh, we, get a, uh, we get a double point here around Jesus' words, that which he spoke. And then his deeds. And it works in parallel, 21 and 22, with regard to what he says. Verses 23 through 25, with regard to what he does. And when he talks about them not being guilty of sin, if he hadn't spoken or performed the works, he's not talking about universally. He's talking about this specific sin of rejecting him. But all these things they will do on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. The sin of rejecting. But he comes, he speaks, he tells them the truth, and they reject it. And now they have no excuse for their sin, because they have been told. And then as if he is repeating... The parallel goes to work. Verse 23, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, that is the miracles. And remember those places where he, he talks about those that reject him? And he says, if you don't believe on account of the things I've said, then believe, believe on account of the miracles themselves. That's, that's the gospel of John. That's how John relates to us the things that Jesus has said. So Jesus' words and Jesus' deeds are the testimony of, of the truth of the redemptive work that he does when he goes to the cross and dies. All of that's preparing. So, so remember how we have miracles and then discourse? All the way back to chapter 2. We have the wedding at Cana. We have uh, the healing of the man born blind um, on chapter 9, right? We have the, the man healed at the, at the pool of Siloam, chapter 5. Um, we have the feeding of the 5,000. End of chapter 5, 6, and 7, you have those, dis and, then, and then you have these long discourses, these long teachings that explain the miracles that he's done. And so it's not strange that John picks up on that and has, records for us Jesus' description of his own ministry as a ministry of word and deed. And the, and the outcome of Jesus' words and deeds is condemnation and rage. And that's really where the world is. Um, I was listening to a Robbie Zacharias presentation here recently, and he was making an observation about how when, when, when his opponents in the debates that he does, who identify as atheistic, when, when they want to go after a, as the world sees it, a religious leader, they always pick Jesus and they always pick Christianity. And they want to point out what they see are challenges and problems with the Bible and how it's put together and how this can't be true or that can't be true or, or how this seems to be a contradiction and sort of make sense out of it. And he says, he asked the question, why don't they ever go after Gandhi? Why don't they ever go after Buddha? Why don't they ever go after some other religious leader? And some of that thinking um, was a part of the book that he wrote, Jesus Among Other Gods, where he teaches not only, only the exclusivity, that is, that Jesus alone is the way of salvation, but he's able to show how he stacks up against the claims of other religions. And more than any other religion in the world, the claims of Christ enrage the world. Isn't that fascinating? Even now, as we're having a, this cultural moment that we're having with regard to dialogue and vocabulary. Whether it's the subject of Islam, LGBTQ, abortion, all of these subjects that are so polarizing at this moment in our history 
are all shaped by politically correct speech aimed at not offending, but neither allowing meaningful discussion. I was listening to this comedian recently talk about the, how this was impacting his, uh, his uh, stand-up comedy. And uh, there was this moment in which he was, he was telling, telling jokes about a particular group of people. You know, it was always dangerous for a stand-up comedian to do that. And there was this woman who stood up in the middle of the presentation, very offended at what he had said and, said, and told him from the crowd, you can't say that. So first of all, you know, it was a joke. And this guy, right, he's uh, an equal opportunity. Like, nobody's safe when he's at the microphone. And he said, oh, yes, yes, I can. In fact, I just did. And you just write the comedy of the moment. The point of that is, it's like we're not even allowed to think through the issue anymore. Because the world hates truth and doesn't want to hear it. All right. At the same time, there's a reorientation of thinking that a lot of us need about some hot button kinds of issues. Because one of the, one of the downfalls of a sermon like this is you might hear me giving you permission to be angry, dour, and sour, and and hurtful when you talk to other people about the things you disagree with them about. And I'm not giving you permission to do either one of those things. In fact, the more you know Jesus and the more assurance you have and his love for you and your friendship with him, then the more ability you have to love those with whom you disagree. In fact, in the words of Roger Nicole, one of my teachers from the seminary, the only thing that you owe those with whom you disagree is love which manifests itself in an ability to listen. You already know you disagree. You already know there's enmity, right? And they're talking and you can't even listen because you're all in turmoil and you want to lash out and you're thinking of the next thing you want to say. Take a deep breath and calm down. Jesus is on the throne. He can handle this cultural moment in our world. Recognize that he told you this was going to happen. Stop lamenting that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and be grateful that your Savior is on the throne, directing it just as he said he would. Look at 16, 1 through 4, one last time. He said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away, to keep you from becoming discouraged because this problem, this opposition, this enmity with the world, it is so real. It is so palpable. It is so powerful. That he knew some of you would be so discouraged you'd want to just give up. They will put you out of the synagogues. They will shut you down. They will exercise their authority to do so. It's not just true about that moment. It's true about every moment after that. You know, the last, the last 200 so years in the history of the... If you want, you could go back to the, you could go back to the 1640s and say 400 years. But that's still a drop in the bucket over 2,000 years since Christ. And those would be very limited places on the globe. But you hear me. The last 200 years of American history is an anomaly on the, on the timeline of church history. For, for the Christian ethic, the Christian mindset, to dominate public discourse... In this country, like it has over the last 200 years, even though we see that waning significantly, that, that is a, an anomaly on the timeline of history. Christians have always, outside of this little microcosm of our nation, have always been the minority voice in majority populations. Because to be friends with Christ is to be at enmity with the world. And let's not forget that that's what he's called us to. As that section ends, and they will do these things because they have not known my father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes and their hour has come, it came to the apostles. It's come to the fathers of the church. It's come to the reformers. And now it has come to us. When their hour comes, you may remember 
that I told them to you. Things are unfolding. This problem is unfolding just as Christ described it would. So what's the solution, brothers and sisters? Where do, where do we find a path forward? Well, in the words of Christ, what he said of himself, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This claim of exclusivity, he's the only way, right? That is so unacceptable to the world today. From the Reformation Study Bible on verse 27, the world's hatred is not due to what the disciples do wrong, but to what they do right. Brothers and sisters, the solution is allegiance to Jesus. The solution is faithfulness to his word in spite of the opposition. Faithful demands that we shun the love of the world. The love from the world when they applaud us, as well as our love for the world. We want what the world offers. Uh, Caleb and I were discussing, my oldest son, we were discussing some of the shift in the conversation about abortion in our country. There was a, a tremendous article in USA Today this past week about a decline in the number of abortions in the United States. Since 2017, 2017 recorded the lowest number of abortions since 1973. And there were still, try not to gasp all the air out of the room, okay? Just be sober minded and listen. Uh, 862,000 recorded abortions in the year 2017 in our country. It's um, mind boggling a little bit. At the high point, according to the article, the statistic, and I've heard other statistics, but according to this article, the height, 1.6 million, um, and it was in just a few short years after the Roe v. Wade decision. But what we were discussing, two aspects. Why the decrease? The article, the article went on to describe not an actual decrease in demand for abortion, but an actual overall decrease in pregnancies. People are having more sex and fewer pregnancies. Now, one last thing to say about this and I'm going to move forward because we're going to get stuck here if I don't. All right. So in the political sphere, working for change on this issue, there is a dynamic occurring in the public discourse. It's something, it's something that those of us who are, who are pro-life have been fighting for for decades now, and understanding that life begins at conception. Acceptance of that idea, that truth, is waning. It's, it's, it's declining, even among those politicians who claim to agree with us. They are now accepting what the other side is saying, and there's all kinds of information that I don't have time to get into as to why this is happening, that, that life that we, that we observe and we identify life when it results in a birth. And because politicians don't want to be seen as crazy, they're ceased by the world. They want, they want to no longer be seen as crazy by the world. They are ceasing to affirm that life begins at conception and they are accepting the dialogue, that the discourse that it begins at birth. And when that happens, when that happens, you will see the whole discourse on this change. It's one example. It's one example. And I'm talking about people who profess to be Christian. They've I'm, 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 I'm in trouble here, but they dare say it. They say they are of the Republican Party, right? And so they like, in the history of this debate, that's the side they're on. And they're changing on a fundamental issue because they don't want to be seen as crazy by the world. I'm not saying that your position on abortion is the thing that identifies you with Jesus or not. I'm not confusing what the gospel is. When the gospel comes in, it can change people's ideas about these other issues. 
what I'm doing is I'm using that as an illustration that on an important ethical issue, people are changing their minds, not based on truth of an idea, but based on public opinion and whether or not they will be loved and accepted. They are living for today and the applause of men rather than for the future and the applause of God. Hmm. I can't wait for Jim to get back. I know he'd have said amen right there. Right? Because that's the reality. Um, Socrates is recorded by Plato as having said, when he says, if someone were to come to me and say, you know, if you keep saying the things you're saying, uh, Socrates, they're going to put you to death. I would reply to that man. Do you think it's the most important thing in the world that I should be considered with living or dying? But rather that I live with only one question in mind. Am I living as a good man or as a bad one? Now, obviously, Socrates lives pre-Christ, pre-Christian, pre-closing of the canon. But here is a man who understands the fundamental issue that is before us. Our allegiance to Christ is the solution. It's the only solution to this problem that we see of opposition. What jersey are we wearing? Whose team are we on? Now, I know there's confusion within all of the cultural and political issues. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your sanctification. I'm talking about your growing, your understanding. We all live by the information that we have. But when new information comes, when you, when you come to see things in Scripture that you never saw before, is your first response to say, that can't be true? Or is your first response to say, mind submit to what God's Word says about Jesus and His world? Faithfulness demands we shun the love of the world, that is, love from the world and love for the world. Before I close this solution issue, I want you to see one last thing. The issue is the exclusivity of Christ. That's what's, that's what's at stake and the radical allegiance that this demands. We get to bear witness with the apostles, verses 26 through 27. He says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness. Now, there is something true and powerful that, that is about the apostles, okay? And their witness is the foundational witness. Paul even tells us this in his letter to the Ephesian church. And when the last apostle dies, a redemptive historical moment comes to a close. The canon is closed. We don't open up the backs of our Bibles and add any new letters that we think might be inspired. Genesis to Revelation, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, those are the ones that we're talking about. But this also applies to us as the heirs of the apostolic witness and the recipients of the Holy Spirit as well. We too bear witness. But the context of that conversation, two things. One, notice what we're bearing witness about. We're bearing witness about Jesus and his redemptive work. But you go all the way back to chapter 14, which is a part of the same discourse. Hone in on verse 6 when he tells them in response to, to the one who asked, you know, we don't know the way. Tell us the way. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is that issue of exclusivity that Jesus is the only way that is so volatile in our times and it requires a radical allegiance and faithfulness to him. That's the grace. It's what, it's what he died for. It's what he was raised again for, was to win a people to himself. And not a half-hearted people who have a foot on two escalators being pulled apart. He came to win for himself a bride who is faithful. I love that image. Because God gave me a Penelope. God gave, God gave me a faithful wife who loves me and cares for me. And I see in the way that my wife loves me, I see a beautiful picture of the church. It's Ephesians 5, 25, right? I see this, this woman who, who sacrifices for the good of her husband and her children. And I see a picture of the church and how she's to behave. Whose team are we on? Whose jersey are you wearing? An allegiance of faithfulness. If you don't know who Penelope is, you can ask me afterwards. 
There is a result that comes. This is the final point, and I will not spend as much time on it as I did on the other two. The result is a blessing, a blessing of courage. Notice where, uh, where Jesus ends this section of the discourse. He ends it with, with his purpose statement regarding our encouragement, the same place I began. Listen, brothers and sisters, I know, I know, I, I, I'm with you. I'm so often discouraged in the face of the world's opposition. I, I would love to be a pastor who makes an impact, you know, and grows a large church. You know, my pride and in my ambition, which, which, which I seek to put to death in Christ every day, you know. I want to preach the word faithfully, and I would like for that to result in great things for us as a, as a, as a First Presbyterian church. This, ex, this particular local expression of God, of God's family, of God's church. I would love that. But that's not what he's promised us. And there's two different kinds of growth. There's growing wide and there's growing deep. And we have to have the courage at this historical moment to be faithful to Jesus. You see, there's a difference between courage and bravado. Courage says, I know I'm weak and I'm probably not up to this task. But in allegiance to my Savior, I want to be faithful. Bravado says, I got this. I got this moment. I'm up to the task. I can handle it. Let it come my way. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about courage, the blessing of courage. He says, but when the helper comes, when the spirit comes, you will bear witness. That radical allegiance of faithfulness results in the blessing of spirit infused courage. To, to speak and preach the truth about the gospel and the life it calls us to live. And with that comes great reward. Just remember this. As you seek to live out of that courage within the spheres of influence that God's given you, the tone and attitude with which you speak to others, let it reflect the assurance and peace that this text tells us we have. We are able to love those we disagree with, even while we disagree with them. My granddaddy used to tell me, he'd say, son, when you disagree, you don't have to be disagreeable. That is a hard line to walk. You have to govern your tone. You have to govern your speech. There was an article, um, I forget what paper it was on because I saw it online, about, um, about our local representative, um, Cameron, Cameron Sexton. Some of you know him. And I, I know Cameron. Um, it was true, it said, it said this one line, a man who is often not the first one to speak. He'd probably be embarrassed if I was talking about him like this, but it was in a newspaper. And that struck me. Because I think if I were described similarly, it would be the opposite. Often too quick to give an answer. I was like, God, change me. Help me with that. Help me to listen better. Help, help my tone and my speech, my vocabulary to reflect the love that you have for this world that you're rescuing. This world that is at enmity with you. This world out of which you plucked me and out of which you're plucking others making for yourself a bride. Let us never forget there is an opposition and the solution is a radical faithfulness to him. But the result, the result is a great reward for us and for all those to whom we bear witness. When they too in turn embrace the Savior. I close finally just by reiterating to encourage you just as Jesus was encouraging his disciples. I've said these things to you to keep you from falling away. To keep you from being discouraged in the face of the world's opposition. Remember Jesus' words and deeds in order to be strengthened in the hope and in the reality. We do not live for today 
or the applause of men. But we live for a future and the applause of God. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would help your church, this church, all those within sound of my voice, that you would help us to hear the words of the Savior. And that we would be so in love with you that our lives would be marked by a radical allegiance to you. This is why you died. It's why you were raised again. Show yourself through us. Even while the world hates us, show yourself through us that your glory might be great and your grace might go to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.